<clears throat> I'd like to welcome everyone and thank you for joining us today. My name is Bill Manning and I'm Executive Director of ASPI. I've been on active surveillance since 2009 and I'm still a member of my local support group that got me started on this journey in the first place. Now, I'd like you to know that ASPI has a lot of exciting things planned for later this year, so stay tuned and watch your emails. We have a great meeting planned for today, and I'd like to remind everyone about the benefits of exercise. Not only does it help your body and mind, but it doesn't require a doctor, a prescription, or a pharmacy. It's actually free, unless you belong to a gym, but otherwise, it's free. Our purpose here is to educate individuals about options regarding active surveillance, which is not a treatment, but a management plan. I would like to remind everyone that we are not anti-treatment, but anti-unnecessary treatment. I'd also like to give a special shout out to the PCRI, especially Peter and Alex Scholes for the production of the AS1, <clears throat> AS101 video series and also our partner organizations, ANCAN, the Prostate Cancer Support Group of, Sa of Canada, the Walnut Foundation, the Active Surveiller, and of course, Dr. Courier for his generosity in participating in this video and joining us today. So a couple of quick housekeeping measures. We're going to hold all questions until after the presentation. You can submit questions in the chat box, which you can access from the chat button at the bottom of your Zoom screen. During the Q&A, you can also click the raise hand icon from the reactions button at the bottom of the Zoom window toolbar. And if there's time, we'll try to call on you. Please keep yourself muted during the meeting. The doctor presenting here today is generously donating his time, so we wanna be respectful of that without interruptions. We are not here to dispense with any medical advice. Nothing said during these meetings by our speaker or ASPE or the audience should take the place of consultations with your medical professionals. Also, you do not need to feverishly take notes during the talk as this meeting is being recorded and will be available on our website in approximately one week unless I can get it done sooner. You will get an email notifying you when it's ready and also, if you subscribe to our YouTube channel, you will automatically be notified when a new video is posted. Now, the last item is watching the meeting. If you'll notice in the upper right corner of your Zoom window, there's a button that says View. When you click that, you can switch between Gallery View, which is everyone, or focus on the speaker. We highly recommend selecting Speaker, which helps you focus on the topic at hand versus what someone in the audience is having for lunch. So without further ado, we'll have a few quick words from Howard Walensky, Active Surveiller Professor Emeritus and the organizer of this meeting. So relax, enjoy the meeting, and I hope that we can all leave a little smarter. So take it away, Howard. Well, thanks, Bill. And <clears throat> for the next hour and a half, you can jog in place. Uh, <laughs> Or you, you can uh, have some uh, uh, wheatgrass, whatever whatever floats your boat. But let me tell, tell you a little bit about um, what's going to happen today. Uh, we're going to show a video in the series uh, Active, Active Surveillance 101. And this is a series of videos where we have featured um, a couple, a man, they, uh, and his wife, he he had uh, low risk prostate cancer, and they interview various experts in the field. And um, we're going to be showing the latest version. This is the movie premiere. No red carpet, I'm afraid. Um, and they're going to be interviewing Dr. Cornier. And let me tell you about him. He is the uh, Professor and Canada Research Chair in Physical Activity and Cancer at the University of Alberta in Edmonton. He and his team have demonstrated how exercise can benefit patients with low risk to high risk prostate cancer. Um, he's going to join us 
if after the video is finished and he he's open to answering questions so please put your questions in the chat box uh, and uh, I, i'd say you know it's time to get your popcorn or your wheatgrass or or whatever so bill take it away This video is for educational purposes only. The information in this video is provided with the understanding that the groups involved are not engaged in rendering medical advice or recommendations. The information provided should not replace consultations with qualified healthcare professionals to meet your individual medical needs. Hi, I'm Anthony Henry, president of the Walnut Foundation in Toronto. Today, the Active Surveillance Coalition is presenting another installment in its AS101 series. The topic is exercise and active surveillance. The AS Coalition is comprised of ASPI, the AS Group within ANCAN, the Active Surveiller Newsletter, Prostate Cancer Support Canada, the Walnut Foundation, and PCRI which has helped in filming and editing these webinars. This webinar series features Larry and Nancy, a couple from New Mexico, who have been on this prostate cancer journey and are our model patient team. They're discussing topics of interest to newly diagnosed Gleason 6 low-risk prostate cancer patients and those who want to review the basics. They're visiting with Dr. Kerry Crenier, Professor and Canada Research Chair in Physical Activity and Cancer at the University of Alberta in Edmonton, Canada. His research focuses on physical activity after a cancer diagnosis or exercise oncology. He and his group are the first to show that exercise can slow the advance uh, of low-risk uh, prostate cancer. Let's begin the webinar now. Hello, I'm Dr. Kernier. Oh, hi, Dr. Kernier. Uh, I'm Larry White. Uh, this is my wife, Nancy. Hi. I'm on active surveillance with a Gleason 6, and I'm trying to do whatever I can with my personal lifestyle uh, to keep this cancer at bay. We've already moved to a whole food plant-based diet, and now we're coming to you to learn what kind of exercise might help in this endeavor. Uh, do you mind if we record this session? Because if we don't, we probably won't remember everything that we've talked about. No, please do, and it's a pleasure to meet you, uh, Larry and Nancy. And Larry, maybe tell me a little bit more uh, about your experience with prostate cancer and some of the questions you might have about exercise. Okay, well, thank you. I will be 72 years old this month. So I've made it this far. <laughs> and I'm relatively healthy. I've exercised on and off most of my life. When I found out I had prostate cancer, though, my anxiety level kind of went through the roof. Uh, even though I had a relatively low uh, Gleason 6 uh, uh, diagnosis, um, I became somewhat fatalistic, actually, or maybe just resigned. Uh, my father had prostate cancer uh, and in the 1980s had um, low-dose brachytherapy. Uh, I don't really know everything around it, but uh, his prostate cancer uh, was not <clears throat> totally cured, and he ultimately died of complications to prostate cancer. But, but probably because of this, I was adamant that I knew exactly what I wanted to do. By golly, I was going to have I was going to have surgery, and I was going to have that prostate taken out, so I would not have metastatic disease. And I mean, that was it. I didn't need any more information. Fortunately, uh, my wife Nancy <laughs> was much more clear-headed than I was. And she began to research uh, everything she could on prostate cancer uh, and ultimately found uh, AMCAN, started going to the sessions uh, and began to learn a great deal. Uh, I didn't go initially, uh, but she convinced me. Actually, people at AMCAN kind of guilted me 
to start going. They thought he didn't exist. They thought I, I didn't there, exist. I was there without him for so many sessions. <laughs> but, but but I started going. And and through that, I was really well educated, began this process over the past year or so, uh, being educated on all aspects of diagnosis and treatment, uh, and began to understand that I had more options than just surgery. Yeah. Mm-hmm. In fact, I would probably die of anything else besides prostate cancer, ultimately. Uh, so, you know, I just, I, I just began to feel like active surveillance based on my history and my diagnosis was the best choice for me. And I've pursued that path, but my anxiety level does remain in that I continue to have the idea that perhaps my prostate cancer might metastasize because I've gone too long with the active surveillance. Um, and uh, a short while ago, we were able to meet with uh, Dr. Stacy Loeb uh, about dietary issues. And based on her experience and research over the years, uh, she felt like a whole food plant-based diet was probably uh, the best type of diet. And we've been on that diet since as well. Yeah. So we know that you've done a great deal of research uh, and experience with, with prostate cancer and exercise. Um, and we've come to you to gain information and learn maybe what is the best exercise approach for me, hopefully to mitigate, uh, uh, the prostate cancer. So how can exercise help a low risk prostate cancer patient like me? Thank you, Larry, for that background and, and, that question. Well, when your father was diagnosed with prostate cancer, he would have not received any information about exercise or lifestyle factors. He would have gone strictly for the medical treatments. And of course, for many cancer patients, medical treatments are the most important thing they do. And lifestyle uh, can also then be a, a kind of an adjuvant therapy for those patients. But for you, you're not getting any medical treatments. There are no uh, treatments being um given to help with your prostate cancer. So lifestyle is actually paramount. The good news is we've made a lot of progress, Larry, since your dad was diagnosed with prostate cancer. We've done uh, dozens and dozens of exercise trials in prostate cancer patients. Now, many of them were in patients who are on active treatment, radiation therapy, androgen deprivation therapy, and so on. But more recently, we've started looking at uh, the role of exercise in uh, active surveillance patients like yourself. And I would say in terms of big picture, there's several key things that exercise may uh, help you with. So perhaps the most important thing on your mind is, can it help slow the progression of the prostate cancer? And we do have a number of studies now suggesting that possibility. Exercise uh, may slow the progression of the prostate cancer. And if it does that, that would allow you to remain on active surveillance longer or perhaps even indefinitely. So that's one of the uh, big findings that I think is very important. The other uh, big finding is you've talked a little bit about anxiety and distress. So in the studies that we've done, we've also shown that exercise can help active surveillance patients manage some of that anxiety and distress that comes with having a uh, prostate cancer that's untreated. And some patients um, tell us that the psychological benefits of exercise are actually even more important to them than the disease-specific benefits. So it's really a powerful aspect of exercise for many cancer patients. And then the third very important factor, Larry, is as you probably know, many active surveillance patients do need treatments at some point. So the the disease may uh, begin to pick up a little bit, progress a little bit, and you may um, be recommended treatments. So the role of exercise there is also very important. We call that prehabilitation. So preparing for these eventual treatments. Most cancer patients get diagnosed and go to treatments very quickly. They don't have a lot of time to prepare and get in shape for those treatments. But being on active surveillance, uh, you will have many months, if not many years, of being able to get yourself in the best shape possible for these treatments that may come, surgery, radiation therapy, hormone treatments. And we know that exercise can reduce surgical complications, it can reduce the length of hospital stay, and it can improve these outcomes after you receive these treatments. So just keeping yourself in the best shape for this possible eventuality. 
<laughs> and the last uh, a big picture benefit that I would talk about, as you mentioned, there's a very good chance you'll die from something else other than the prostate cancer. And that will likely be cardiovascular disease, diabetes, COPD, these other types of diseases. Cardiovascular disease is exercise's original claim to fame. That's right. the key thing that we've documented in the literature to lower the risk of cardiovascular disease, lower the risk of heart attacks and other uh, problems. So exercise has power, powerful effects on the cardiovascular system. So even if it doesn't help with the prostate cancer or some of these other uh, cancer-specific outcomes, helping with uh, some of these other disease-related factors is very important. So I think there's benefits across the board for a patient like yourself on active surveillance. Dr. Kernier, it's so nice to meet you. Um, how did scientists discover that exercise slows low-risk prostate cancer? What biomarkers are measured in your research? Yeah, so uh, uh, some of the research is what we call preclinical research or research in animal studies. So the same way the drug developers will test their drugs initially in these rodent models where they'll inject a, a small number of prostate cancer cells or implant a prostate cancer tumor, and they'll give the animals the drug or not and see what happens. We do the same thing with exercise. So we've got studies uh, in these rodent models where we uh, inject some prostate cancer cells, but instead of giving these uh, mice or, or rats a drug, we get them to exercise or not exercise. And we can look at how these prostate cancer cells grow. And what those studies have shown is the mice that exercise, the prostate cancer grows more slowly. So that's very helpful preclinical evidence to suggest that we're having some positive effect on those prostate cancer cells. The other way we do it more in human studies is um, we do studies where we get the men to exercise versus not. And then we put their uh, blood or serum in a Petri dish with prostate cancer cells. And then we can track how do these prostate cancer cells grow in the serum of men who have exercised versus the serum of men who have not exercised. And once again, we see the prostate cancer cells that are placed in serum of men who exercise grow more slowly than the men who didn't exercise based on some of these biological things like uh, immune cell uh, uh, factors, anti-inflammatory mechanisms, uh, and other growth factors like insulin, IGF. So we know all these changes can slow the growth of these prostate cancer cells. And then the last way they've done it is more uh, what we call observational studies. So just assessing men with prostate cancer in terms of their exercise levels and following a long term for actual clinical outcomes like death from prostate cancer and recurrence of prostate cancer. Now, those studies haven't been done in active surveillance yet, so we don't have these kind of observational studies. But in uh, men with prostate cancer on treatments, the studies have shown that th those guys who report higher exercise levels have a lower risk of dying from prostate cancer many years down the road, suggesting that it probably is, again, slowing the growth of those prostate cancer cells. So the exercise itself produces uh, biochemicals in the system that really does improve the immune system in general. Is, is that right? That might help again? That's right. So there's very good, what we call biological plausibility. You know, exercise is not a hocus pocus type of uh, uh, therapy. It has strong biological effects. And when you engage in acute exercise session, it stimulates all sorts of changes, an increase in the number of natural killer cells, an increase in the activity of those natural killer cells, also T cells. As I mentioned, anti-inflammatory mechanisms are dispersed into the systemic blood system. And all these biological changes can then go and track down these prostate cancer cells anywhere in the body, including in the prostate. So uh, exercise will increase kind of blood flow to the prostate and deliver some of these biological or biochemical changes right into the prostate and potentially uh, slow the growth of those cells. Causes one to certainly want to exercise. Yeah. So uh, uh, one other question I had was, does, it, does the PSA go down as well with all these other things going on? Do you see a PSA drop as well? Yeah, great question, Larry. So in our study, we did track PSA and we did see reductions in PSA levels. And these were men on active surveillance uh, in the men who did the exercise and also a slowing of PSA velocity. So how quickly the, the PSA is increasing over time. That's right. another very important biomarker suggestive that exercise might be slowing uh, the progress of the pros, uh, prostate cancer. 
based on your research and, and, and everything, it seems like I probably would really like to be on a very good uh, exercise program. So, so uh, what would you recommend? What program would you recommend for me uh, kind of describing the elements of that that I could benefit from and reasonable to start? You already for, garden. Oh, oh, yeah, that's true. <laughs> I, I, for, I forgot. I do garden uh, and I do like to go for walks in the, in the forest. So, uh, but... Does it help? <laughs> yeah, uh, absolutely. So there's a few general principles I can give you before we get into specifics. So one of the general principles in exercise science is some exercise is better than none. So even gardening, even walking, that can be helpful. In fact, a lot of the benefits are sort of moving from a completely sedentary phase into doing some activity. But the second principle is also important, and that is more exercise tends to be better than less. So a higher volume tends to produce more benefit. And by more exercise, it could be more frequently, it could be at a higher intensity, longer duration, uh, and so on. The final um, principle we sometimes follow, Larry, is the best exercise is the one that you will do. So right. that is obviously key. Right. It's about right. motivation here. So you need to find an exercise that you say, um, you know, I enjoy this exercise. It's something I'm going to continue to do. The way I encourage patients to think about it is don't come up with an exercise program you're going to do for the next uh, six weeks or the next three months. Come up with something you're going to do for the rest of your life. So it has to be feasible. It has to be realistic for you, for you to do because I want you to do in this exercise program well into your 80s and beyond. So with those general principles, um, what do we recommend? Well, uh, the, the typical guidelines, including for prostate cancer patients, is about 150 minutes a week of aerobic exercise or cardiovascular exercise. So that can be your walking, jogging, cycling, and so on. So about two and a half hours uh, of that. And you can get that different ways. It, the, you know, they encourage you to spread it out over the week, not try and do it all in one day, but spread it out, typically at least three days per week, um, but up to seven days a week as well. And then on top of that aerobic exercise, we do recommend strength training. So we call those the combined exercise guidelines, aerobic exercise plus strength guidelines. And these can be body weight exercise, like push-ups and sit-ups and 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 those types of things. But oftentimes it's the weight training exercise. And that can be really beneficial for patients. And there we recommend that two to three days per week. You know, that's a lot to ask. So, you know, two and a half hours of aerobic, couple of days of strength training, that already is quite a bit to ask. Are there more benefits even beyond that? There are. So the guidelines say even just two and a half, up to five hours a week of aerobic exercise. There's still additional benefits. You know, the benefits of exercise don't really plateau until you start to get into half marathons and marathon runners where you're saying this is a very high volume of uh, exercise where there's no probably no really further benefits. And in fact, in rare cases, you know, too much exercise can occur. But for someone like yourself, you've got this sweet spot of two and a half to five hours a week of moderate intensity to vigorous intensity exercise and two to three days per week of weight training, if possible, if that's feasible. Um, but less than that is also beneficial. So even your walking program and your gardening program is likely to, to be beneficial. Well, yeah, there's, so what would low intensity look like? Uh, how, how fast would I need to walk and kind of low intensity or, and then what would high intensity, a high intensity workout look like? A casual walk, uh, we would call that kind of a low intensity exercise. And typically you can look for things, you know, like uh, uh, light sweating and you want to notice an increase in your breathing rate. Can you notice that your heart rate's beating faster and your breathing rate is increasing? If it's not, then that's probably your light intensity exercise. You know, you're out there gardening. Um, you can carry on a conversation while you're doing the activity. Once you get to moderate intensity, um, you'll notice some of these physiological changes. You can tell you're having to breathe a little bit harder, your heart rate's up. You can still carry on a conversation, as they say. You can talk, but not sing, because you're sort of um, trying to get air into the lungs to um, get the muscles oxygenated. The higher intensity exercise is typically something like running. So once you get into that higher intensity, you're really focused on your breathing. You notice your heart rate is up substantially and they're sweating. 
and even carrying on a conversation is not very comfortable. You want to just focus on keeping a, a regular breathing rate. So that's kind of physiologically um, how we know you're getting into a higher intensity exercise. You go to YouTube these days and there's so many different types of exercises. I guess I need to go to a trainer probably that might be beneficial, although I don't know how many trainers are familiar with prostate cancer and active surveillance, that sort of thing. But when I think of the zone training, zone two, zone five, the various ways that uh, cyclists train and that sort of thing, um, versus versus hit and can can you explain uh, at least the hit program and and yeah. I would assume that's pretty high intensity that one would look at for high intensity. The hit training we call high intensity interval training and it's really just trying to get in short bouts of higher intensity exercise while you're doing kind of lighter or moderate intensity exercise because it's hard for uh, people to maintain high intensity for a long period of time yet we know that type of exercise is very beneficial for patients. So it's kind of like a bolus or a short burst of energy expenditure that really uh, stirs the biological soup and gets a, a lot of these biochemical changes going. So for someone like you, Larry, it would be very easy. So you mentioned you already love to walk. So you go out and you walk for uh, a couple minutes at your casual pace, and then you walk briskly for one minute. And then you might walk at your casual pace for a couple minutes and then briskly for one minute. So this is what we mean by altering the intensity. And then once you get up to it, you could walk for several minutes and then jog for one minute. And then walk for several minutes, jog for one minute. So these are kind of these short little intervals that you do and allows you to build up gradually and also get some of these benefits of this higher intensity exercise without having to maintain it for 30 or 45 minutes continuously. So that sounds reasonable. I mean, so for me, uh, an optimal program, assuming my knees are okay, hips, my musculoskeletal system's okay. Yeah. Uh, what would you think of for me as a as an optimal program? So I combine optimal and, and feasible. So, you know, three days per week is really ideal. I think it's hard for people to exercise every day. Now, stuff like walking every day is fine. So this is where you're not changing your clothes, you're not showering afterwards, you're just out walking, casual walking outside or in the mall or getting groceries. So that type of activity can be done every day. But in terms of an exercise training program, I'd say three days per week. And this is a program where you're going to change your clothes before you do it, and you're going to have to shower afterwards because you're working up a, a good sweat. And this is where you can do some of this uh, interval training outside while you're walking if you want, treadmill cycle, uh, you know, stationary bike, elliptical, whatever you prefer. Um, and so three days per week, I think is fine for that. For the weight training, we say two to three days per week. So even two days per week of weight training, and we've done these studies in prostate cancer patients, you know, improve strengths, it adds uh, muscle mass and improves quality of life. And so um, feasibility, Larry, it's easier to sort of combine your weight training with the same time you do the aerobic exercise. So again, it's still three days per week, but two of those days, in addition to your sort of aerobic workout, you'll add some of this weight training. And typically we recommend, you know, all the major muscle groups uh, covered. So the shoulders, the, the, the chest, the stomach, the quadriceps, the uh, hamstrings, and so on. It's about eight different exercises. And you can do uh, a couple sets of those different weight training exercises. And normally we recommend anywhere from like eight to 15 repetitions. And what that means is by the time you get to 15 repetitions, you you should be fairly tired. If, if you're still whipping the weight up at 15, 60, it's too light. Uh, if you can't do eight, so in other words, you get to five and you're done with it, it's too heavy. So somewhere in that eight to 15 range where you start to fatigue, and then that's a good weight uh, for that particular exercise. So that would be a great program, Larry, that would have all sorts of fitness benefits, functional benefits, quality of life benefits, and yes, possibly slow the progression of the prostate cancer, prepare you for any potential treatments down the road, lower your risk uh, for cardiovascular disease uh, as well. In starting this for someone that doesn't have much experience, would you recommend going to see a trainer? And what is the best environment to exercise in if there, if there is one? So yeah, seeing a trainer is uh, fantastic. This will uh, be an expert who can assess your fitness level and see what is good for you in terms of starting. 
and see, you know, what muscles are weak, what muscles are strong, what type of program might be good for you. So if you have a little bit of money that you can go and get a, a formal fitness test done and get an exercise prescription, it's a great start. Uh, the best environment. Uh, that's a really important question, Larry, because we typically recommend exercise from an exercise physiology perspective, uh, not an exercise psychology perspective. So the exercise physiology perspective says the environment doesn't matter. You know, if you're jogging, there's going to be physiological changes. And it doesn't matter if you're out jogging in a beautiful park or hiking trails, or you're in your basement on a treadmill with a 60 watt bulb in a dark room, right? Physiologically, those changes are the same. But we know psychologically, uh, it can be very different. Um, and so the psychological benefits can be driven more by the physical environment, the social environment, exercising with other people uh, as well. So yes, um, you, you talked about a, a plant-based diet. I recommend plant-based exercise. So this is exercise that's outside in the hiking trails, going through parks uh, and other kind of beautiful environments. And you'll find that the psychological benefits of that exercise is even more profound. And the motivation and adherence to do it um, can also be much higher. So find a, a, an environment that you like. And, um, and if it's feasible to do that, that's great. I read that about 50% of men on active surveillance have emotional distress issues such as anxiety and depression, and 10% of the cases are to the point that they are considering aggressive uh, treatment that they might not need because they're so anxious. Um, yeah. Can exercise help these patients cope with their distress levels? Yeah, so we looked at that in our study of, of men on active surveillance, and, and we really found some important psychological benefits in addition to the biochemical benefits. And so we found the men that did this, this was a HIT training program, Larry, so similar to the one that I described to you. Uh, they had lower anxiety related to their prostate cancer. They had lower perceived stress, um, but perhaps most important of, of all, they, they even had lower anxiety related to their fear of cancer progression. So this, of course, is a big psychological factor um, for cancer patients. You've got the prostate cancer and this distress over whether or not it may progress. And this can ultimately, as you said, Nancy, it can drive these men to say, give me the treatment, just take mm -hmm. the cancer out, get rid of it. I, I don't wanna deal with this stress. But we found that it um, improved or lowered their fear of cancer progression. And so we hypothesize from that, that might help these men stay on active surveillance uh, longer if they're not as distressed uh, about having the prostate cancer. And as I also mentioned, uh, Larry, you know, many of the participants in our study say these psychological benefits to them are just as important as the physiological and, and the cancer-related benefits. And some of them will say, you know, exercise helps me feel normal. And they say everything about cancer is not normal. But when I go out and exercise, I feel like my life is normal again, and I'm on my own routine and doing things. And that can be, I think, psychologically relaxing and enjoyable for these men. So yeah, very important psychological benefits uh, from these exercise programs, especially you know, if you get out into a nice physical environment or you're exercising with your spouse or with other men on active surveillance and stuff as well, that can also add to some of the psychological benefits of exercise. Right, so the relationship piece as well as the environment are just an additive effect that can be very beneficial for the person's overall. That's right. Yeah. yeah. When we ask patients, you know, what makes exercise fun and enjoyable, they'll often talk about the social interaction that happens. They'll um, uh, talk about the pleasantness of the environment. And the other way, Larry, I don't know if you have any interest in sport at all, but, you know, sport is another great way of making an activity fun, whether you like playing soccer or basketball or golf or uh, other recreational activities, you know, incorporating a little bit of a, a sport component can really make the activity enjoyable as well. That's good. You know, I used to joke, I, I really, I feel perfectly great when I'm watching soccer and football on TV <laughs> in my easy chair. You know, I, I just don't have any pain, you know, and, and uh, you know, it's pretty nice. But I, I, you're telling me that's not really the best approach, I think. <laughs> get out there and engage in the sport yeah that, okay. that's right yeah absolutely we have some younger friends that are who are also on active surveillance do you uh, recommend the same exercise program for older men say 70 years and older that you recommend for younger men 50s and 60s or might those 
programs vary a bit? Yeah, we generally make the same recommendations. Uh, uh, but one of the key things is, you know, we're, we typically will recommend exercise based on fitness levels more so than age. Mm. So you can have some of these younger guys who are in very poor shape. And it might be a very different prescription. You can have men in their 70s who are very fit. There's guys out there who are running half marathons and full marathons in their 70s and even into their 80s. So a lot of it is what's the health condition of the patient? What kind of shape has he kept himself in over these many years? Having said that, generally, as you age, you become less fit. So older men are certainly at risk of being less fit and less healthy than these younger men. So usually we have to take those factors into account more so for older men than younger men. But in terms of the aerobic guidelines and strength guidelines, they're very similar. The one main difference, uh, Nancy, is for older men, uh, we also recommend balance exercises. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, the risk of falling is a very important issue in older uh, patients, and exercise can really help with balance. So there's specific balance exercises you can do, such as standing on one leg, um, heel-toe walking, where you uh, place the heel and toe uh, uh, attached to each other while you're walking forward, walking backwards, and other um, activities, even doing something like bicep curls while you're standing on one leg. So there's a bunch of these different balance exercises that can be very important for uh, patients maintaining balance, especially while you're exercising, because exercising can sort of uh, be a risk for falling as well. So you want to make sure you've got good balance as you uh, get older. Oh, absolutely. So it sounds like you, know, you want to do the aerobic piece, strength training, and really balance and work on functional kinds of exercises, yeah. which you're going to need getting older, right? Getting up off the floor, uh, taking care of dishes, uh, uh, you know, just being able to carrying engage. Groceries. Yeah, carrying and groceries. Thank you. Yeah. Carrying and groceries. Uh, uh, just really being in the best possible condition that you can be in, not only for cancer, but just well-being and, and the longevity that we're going to have. Yeah. As one of our famous exercise scientists said, Larry, uh, everything that gets worse with aging gets better with exercise. So okay. this is the way you can think about it. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for your time, Dr. Cornier. We really appreciate it. We've learned a lot. Yeah, it was a pleasure meeting you, Larry and Nancy. And Larry, best of luck with your exercise program. Well, thank you. Might have to be back in touch with you, though. And and uh, as I lose my way, I used to joke that I exercise to the point of glistening. If I begin to glisten, I back off. And <laughs> you're telling me that's not the right approach. So it's not necessarily uh, the best. You can do it, Larry. Keep me posted on things. Do you think we've come away with, with what we need? Or, or do you think that we left something out or didn't think of a question to ask? Or, you know, as we try to figure this whole process out? No, uh, no. I think there's lots of uh, excellent questions, Larry, that a lot of men have who are on active surveillance. So, you know, I think the key thing is primarily you want to manage that active surveillance uh, and you want to manage it physiologically as well as psychologically to avoid these treatments for as long as possible and then be in the best possible shape if you do need treatments at some point. And then, yes, keep in mind cardiovascular disease, diabetes, and these other things as well that exercise can help with. So exercise is really, you know, one of these um, uh, key behaviors that you engage in that will help with so many aspects of uh, functioning, uh, quality of life, and disease management. There are many, many websites. So you can go to the American Cancer Society. You can go to the American College of Sports Medicine. Um, ASCO, the American Society of Clinical Oncology, now has exercise guidelines. Even the Prostate Cancer Foundations now have exercise guidelines out there that will summarize a lot of these um, key points that I've discussed. Thank you so much. Uh, it's been incredibly helpful, and I am ready to mend my ways and uh, Me too. <laughs> get into it with, with her. We'll exercise together as well. Thank you so Fantastic. much. Fantastic. Thank, Thank you. you again. A special thank you to, to Larry, Nancy, Dr. Kernier, and all involved in today's presentation. We hope you found actionable takeaways from this presentation to aid in your prostate cancer journey. Thank you for attending. Appreciate everybody's patience. 180 of you are here. Um, and now I know Dr. Cornier is here, if he can uh, show his face, I see him. 
and, and he's waving. Uh, but let's see, microphone's on. So I, I'm going to start with a couple of questions. Um, and Bill, if you can uh, check out the, uh, I the am. chat box. But Dr. Cornier, um, you know, we, what was actually the first that you established and was it for active surveillance or low risk patients or was it for more advanced patients and is it slowing the disease or preventing the disease or reversing the disease? So in terms of where this research in prostate cancer started, Howie, Howard? You can call me Howie, my mom did. <laughs> So, I mean, in terms of linking physical activity to prostate cancer, um, that started probably in the 1980s, and it was all in terms of a risk factor for, for lowering the chances of getting prostate cancer, so more on the prevention side. And that's where the studies initially started. Once we started studying exercise in prostate cancer patients, um, we started with uh, patients on androgen deprivation therapy. Just because of the side effects of that treatment seem to be a really good match for what exercise might do. So these hormone therapies, of course, completely eliminate testosterone levels, and that has all sorts of side effects for these men. And so we started testing these different weight training programs and found the men to respond very well in terms of strength and fitness, but also these quality of life outcomes and fatigue. So we really studied it more from what we would call a quality of life or supportive care type of approach. And then yes, there's a number of studies in men with metastatic prostate cancer who might be on these treatments for many, many years. And so those studies um, then initiated. So active surveillance in some ways was kind of the last prostate cancer group that we started to study in, in part, Howard, because it is a bit more of a newer approach. You know, 20 years ago, 10 years ago, there wasn't much going on in terms of active surveillance where we did have a lot of treatments for these prostate cancer patients. So now that active surveillance is catching on, you're starting to see the exercise researchers catch up with um, this new approach and trying to ask the question, what's the role of exercise on, in the active surveillance setting? In terms of the cancer outcomes, studies have been done in, in men with advanced prostate cancer uh, and also uh, the different uh, treatments, radiation therapy and so on and then more recently, active surveillance. So we do have a few studies out now, Howard, that are looking at whether exercise can slow the progression of prostate cancer or reduce the likelihood of needing to go on to treatments in the active surveillance setting. Can I clarify too, have you actually seen a reduction in PSA uh, in connection with exercise? Yes, there's been a couple of studies. Ours in particular was probably uh, one of the one of the first studies to demonstrate that a high intensity exercise program lowered PSA levels. We had seen it earlier in a couple uh, of studies that included exercise, but they also included diet. So a couple of the uh, early studies done by Dean Ornish and some other uh, people that were combining different diets with exercise showed that PSA levels could be reduced. Ours was the first to show that exercise alone, without any dietary changes, could in fact lower PSA levels. And now we've also seen a couple of what we call observational studies, studies where we just assess exercise levels and follow these men over time to show that the men who exercise have a lower chance of their PSA increasing. So Howard, um, I'd like to jump in with a couple of questions here. There's one uh, actually directed to Dr. Kernier and uh, Keith asks that he understands that bike riding can increase PSA, but is bike riding detrimental to the prostate gland? Yeah, a great question. And that's gotten a little bit of a attention uh, lately. And, and yes, um, but the question is correct. We sometimes see a little bit of a push of PSA levels immediately after bike riding and sometimes even right after just vigorous intensity exercise. So we have to be aware of that when we're testing PSA. Some of the recommendations are, you know, don't do intense exercise or biking within 24 hours of getting your PSA tested. In terms of the damage to the to prostate gland, I think it's it's a, it's a, a valid 
point. So some of these studies have shown that men who ride bikes for extended periods of time, so these are avid bike riders um, who are doing eight to 10 hours of biking uh, a week, have a little bit higher risk of prostate cancer. Now, um, that, that findings view is a little bit controversial because what the study also showed is that those who rode bikes um, for a little bit of time and a lot of time, both groups had lower risk of getting prostate cancer than those who didn't exercise at all. So both were beneficial, but the group that did the high volumes of bike riding were at slightly higher risk than those who did the lower volume, suggesting that there is some potential link between bike riding. So yes, the, the bikes can compress uh, mechanically on the prostate gland. And we see this, uh, we've even seen increased risk for things like testicular cancer and the same sort of rationale or argument that, you know, mechanical pressure on the testicles, bruising of the testicles. And we know any injury to any organ can damage cells. And then these can make these cells more likely to become cancerous. So with the prostate and the bike riding, you're mechanically compressing the prostate and it can do a little bit of damage and it can cause some inflammation over time. And these inflammatory responses can, can increase the risk of prostate cancer. So it's, it's a valid point, but it's not a huge risk. Uh, and they do have a, a number of bicycle seats that attempt to address that now. You can buy certain bicycle seats that will kind of lower the pressure on the prostate. And again, um, Bill, it's only a concern for men who are really doing very high volumes, not your casual biker who goes out and rides the bike for half an hour, a few times per week. These are kind of your competitive cyclists, cyclists who are doing sort of eight to 10 hours a week of very intense biking. And by the way, uh, Kerry, uh, since you brought up the, well, since you responded to a question about the bike, uh, there's another one that maybe you, address but jeff is asking is there any data on recumbent bikes versus regular bikes uh, good question i've not seen any data on that but theoretically the issue would be what's what's the pressure on the prostate and if, if these recumbent bikes where you're sitting back and your legs are kind of elevated a little bit probably are putting less mechanical uh, impact on the prostate so just you know, without any evidence, I would suggest based on the, uh, how these bicycles work, that there might be a lower risk of mechanical um, pressure in the recumbent bikes than, say, the standard bikes that you might use. You know, if I can follow up with something or to bring up something that you mentioned in passing about diet, you know, realistically, what's more important uh, watching your diet or exercising in terms of the prostate context. Well, you're asking that to an exercise scientist, Howard. <laughs> yeah. Um, but to, to trying to step back and objectively look at things, I think exercise is producing stronger biochemical changes than some of these diets. And then you add the quality of life issues and the improvements in physical functioning. You know, eating more fruits and vegetables is not going to make you physically stronger or more functional. It doesn't increase your cardiovascular fitness. And these are the things that drive activities of daily living. You know, you're trying to live your life and enjoy your life as you get into your 70s, as you get into your 80s. And that's all driven by your functional um, fitness. You know, how strong are you? Can you stand up from a chair? Can you uh, go up multiple flights of stairs without getting out of breath? Exercise is the only activity that drives those types of outcomes. And then in terms of the prostate cancer outcomes, the exercise data, I think, is looking even stronger than some of the dietary data. Certainly eating a healthy diet is going to be very important, Howard, especially for things like some of the cardiovascular disease risk factors, you know, cholesterol levels, blood pressure, some of the diabetes related issues as well. So it's very important. But in terms of what might have the biggest impact, on quality of life and functioning and prostate cancer outcomes, I think the data would favor exercise over diet. We have a question, again, relating to exercise and diet. And what uh, Sean is asking is, if exercise and healthy diets have been shown to slow the progression of prostate cancer, why is it not considered a form of treatment? Great question. <laughs> and. Um, 
I just saw, it was just sent around a couple days ago to our group that the IRS, so this is your internal revenue uh, service. I'm, I'm from Canada. We've got a different uh, tax uh, group here, but the IRS in the U.S. Uh, now apparently recognizes exercise as treatment. And what they've put out now is that you can get the same sort of tax deductions if you can demonstrate that the exercise you've been recommended or the exercise you're doing is being used to treat some disease. And this was only a few days ago that the IRS has now put out this statement that we will now consider the possibility that for some diseases, exercise might be viewed treatment and you can write off some of these expenses related to exercise. So Bill, that would be a big break for, breakthrough of recognizing exercise as treatment. In terms of cancer treatment, We've got um, the cancer organizations now starting to support it. So I mentioned uh, during my videotape talk there, the American Society of Clinical Oncology. And this will also be, for example, the American Society of Urologists and, and the urology societies are now formally recommending exercise to cancer patients. The big difference there, which I think gets at the question that was raised, is they're saying we're endorsing it for quality of life benefits. And we're endorsing it for symptom management, not yet as a cancer treatment. So they're not saying exercise is a prostate cancer treatment for men on active surveillance or who have uh, actively treated disease. So they're not quite there yet, but I think we're moving in that direction. Well, that's good to hear. And if I could do a quick follow up to that, there's another question that asks, um, why has the AUA not encouraged exercise as a form of treatment? for decades yeah so again it might depend bill on how we use this term treatment so oftentimes we reserve treatment for the disease itself right people sometimes oft, uh, will also use treatment for treatment for fatigue or treatment for peripheral neuropathy or or treatment for cognitive dysfunction and so in that sense exercise is an established treatment but it's for these kind of side effects and symptoms that these men experience the, the urological associations are not there yet where they can say exercise is a treatment for the prostate cancer. And in part, Bill, it's because a lot of these studies, including ours, are fairly small. You know, these are smaller studies showing some possible treatment benefits or the, the, these observational or epidemiological studies suggesting exercise is associated with a lower uh, progression of prostate cancer. We haven't done the type of trials that the drug researchers do where they're randomizing thousands of men on these different treatments and demonstrating that this new drug, you know, reduces prostate cancer mortality. So the quality of the evidence for many of these urologists is not there to say exercise is a treatment for prostate cancer. Bill, if I can. Uh, button. Yep. Um, okay, you, you, well, it, it, First, a comment, uh, you know, what you're saying about uh, these huge drug studies. Well, if the incentive is there to make some money, I, I you know, I don't know that ex selling exercise equipment or gym memberships is up in the category of, of uh, you know, making a killing, so to speak, with, with uh, pharmaceutical. Howard, I, I've tried to patent exercise for years, but I just can't seem to get the patent on exercise. So yeah, I can't market it and sell it. You patented in spirit, <laughs> so. But let me you. But let me ask you. I mean, your brand name here seems to be high intensity uh, interval training, and I, I, I'd like you to. And I'm sure you're familiar with the studies out of University of California, San Francisco where I think they find a benefit from risk walking. And uh, there was some Scandinavian study, which I have a link laying around here somewhere. Uh, let's find her name. Uh, a Swedish study uh, that, that looked at fitness, I guess. So, you know, how, how are, is there a difference between your high intensity interval training that you've patented uh, versus uh, uh, brisk walking. Is yeah. brisk walking enough? Yeah, uh, I think the answer is both are effective. So even in the drug trials, they always try and establish what's a minimally effective dose and what's the optimal dose. 
Sometimes they call it the maximally tolerated dose. And sometimes we're giving too much of the drug. You know, hey, they can tolerate this. Let's give them all this drug. And some researchers are saying, hey, we can back off on some of that drug and still get the same benefits. So in exercise, we try and think of the same thing. What's the minimally effective dose that's helpful? And then what's the optimally effective dose that might maximize the benefits? And so I think walking uh, is effective. So it's on that kind of minimally effective. So you can get benefits from these types of walking programs. But most have shown that this higher intensity exercise is a little bit more beneficial. In fact, some studies directly compare high intensity interval training with what they call moderate continuous training, which is more like walking type programs, and do show some additional benefits. These have not been done in prostate cancer per se, but in other groups. So I suspect, Howard, there, there is what we call a dose response association, where doing a bit more is better. But yeah, these mm -hmm. walking programs, um, they've been demonstrated, as you say, that the, the UCSF study that walking uh, is sufficient to get some of these benefits in prostate cancer patients. Gotcha. Now, Bill, I, I have an email question uh, from somebody who is in, in the audience. He's been okay. on, uh, this is Dan. Uh, he's been on active surveillance for three years. He's been a jogger since he was 36. He's now 77. He had a hip replacement. Uh, he's been limited to walking five miles a day, five days a week. He does weights three days a week for 15, min 15 minutes before his walk. He's, a he's asking, should I add interval training? So he's got a pretty good limitation. If it's five miles a day of walking, three days of strength training, that's <laughs> that's a good level of uh, limitation. But no, what he's doing is plenty, and he will get a ton of benefits from doing that. If he's able and feels up to it, um, yes, you know, we, we've seen in lots of studies, including some in prostate cancer, that this vigorous intensity or higher intensity exercise can produce more biological changes that are consistent with slowing the biochemical progression of prostate cancer. So uh, assuming he's walking briskly there, he's probably in the moderate intensity category. The strength training program is fantastic. If he wants to incorporate more vigorous intensity exercise, the HIIT training is the way to do it. So, you know, he can walk for three or four or five minutes to warm up. And then if he's able to jog for one minute, and then walk for a few minutes and then jog for one minute. It's these kind of little boosts or boluses of high intensity exercise. So again, assuming with the hip replacement and the health issues and stuff that that still feels good, that's important. Um, the risk is these musculoskeletal injuries. So, you know, what I wouldn't want to do for this guy is all of a sudden because he's trying to, to do the jogging, you know, the knee starts to ache or the hip that's been replaced starts to ache and now he's off of exercise for an extended period of time. So you have to do, you wanna do what's within your capability and only if it feels fine to do it. If you start experiencing any sort of pain, you know, while you're trying to boost up the intensity, you might wanna back off, whether it's due to arthritis or hip replacements or other types of issues. Bill? Yeah, um, there's a question addressing specific um, equipment that can be used for um, exercise. I mean, obviously on the one end, you've got um, a gym, perhaps a physical trainer, then maybe another notch down, you've got some exercise equipment within your house. Um, I actually have an elliptical. Um, and then one level down from that though is uh, weights, uh, barbells, could you advise some particular, um, I guess you'd call it low cost, um, items that you could use in your home, uh, without having to, uh, go to a gym, for example. Yeah. Well, and let me add, uh, there was a question about somebody else who's living in Canada, uh, about five months a year. He, he can't, uh, get outdoors. Carrie, I've seen pictures of you that maybe that's your park in the background, but uh, that, you know, fitting in with Bill's point, you know, for people who are weather constricted, 
I'll tell you this, it's like summer year round here in Chicago. <laughs> yeah, all, all great questions. So you're right, Bill. I mean, you can join a fitness center and they're gonna have everything. They're gonna have all the different aerobic equipment and they're gonna have all of the weight training, the free weights, as well as the universal equipment that helps you guide some of the strength training and you have access to expertise. So that's fantastic if you're able to afford a gym membership, um, but also if you're willing to drive and go to the fitness center. So it can be a convenience issue as well. And say, okay, you know, it's a 10 minute drive, it's a 15 minute drive, and sometimes that can undermine motivation. Say, oh, I kind of feel like I'm going to, but nah, I don't want to drive 10 to 15 minutes, especially during the winter months. So the, the fitness centers are a great option if you don't mind the, the travel as well as the expense. Like you, Bill, I have the, the fitness equipment in the home because it is extremely convenient. So I've got the elliptical uh, as well, and I've got a few weights, a few free weights where I can do almost all the exercises that I want to do. And it's just, you only need a small number of dumbbells. So I've got five pound weights, 10 pound weights, 15 pounds, and uh, I think I go up to 25. And that range is all I need for the different exercises that I do, including shoulder presses, bicep curls, I do lateral arm raises, I lay on a bench and I do the flies and so on. So even that simple range from five pounds for things like, you know, my lateral raise, to the 25 pounds for things like my fly weights covers a really good exercise program. So it's just a small number of these um, um, dumbbells. And then yeah, good piece of aerobic exercise equipment, whether it's treadmill, uh, elliptical, a stair climber, or a, a cycle ergometer. Um, that can be fantastic. And if you don't have the home equipment, then as Howard said, you're kind of pushed outside and that's fine if you've got year round good weather, but in Edmonton, Canada, there is about five months of the year where, you know, I would not recommend seniors going out trying to walk on our sidewalks and stuff with the, the black ice and the slippery sidewalks and stuff. It's quite dangerous for falls. So that's a problem if you don't have any home equipment. During the nice months, yeah, walking outside, you know, we live in a neighborhood that's got lots of walking paths around it and stuff as well. That is very convenient very enjoyable type of activity so it's really just thinking about the pros and cons you know do you want to go to a fitness center and have to drive and have to pay do you want equipment in your home and if you do have it in your home bill what's a good location for it you know don't stick it down in your unfinished basement in the storage room as i said that has the 60 watt bulb and you're staring into pink insulation you know go down there on that treadmill it's not going to last long you get the treadmill they're elliptical in your nice uh, finished basement with a nice uh, TV in front of it, you hop on the elliptical and you watch the baseball game, you watch the golf, you know, combining uh, this equipment, uh, watching TV is extremely uh, efficient. You know, most guys watch a boatload of television. And so when I hear guys say, I don't have time to exercise, I say, well, how much time do you spend watching TV? About 20 hours a week. Okay, there's 20 hours a week of possible exercise time. You just put your treadmill or your uh, elliptical right in front of the television there and you hop on it whenever you want to watch one of your shows and again a few weights and you can cover many of the many of the strength training exercises as well yeah bill if i can step in i got a couple of things yep. here um uh first of all jeff wants you carry to repeat your uh quote maybe you even have the source of the quote about the challenges of getting old uh, an exercise. Do you remember that? Oh, um, I, I, I got a few of them, Howard. I'm not, I'm not sure. I, 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 I'm, it's coming back to me as something like, you know, that everything get, that gets worse oh, yeah. with aging gets better with exercise. That's Maybe right. He, so, did, I, did I get that quote right? Yeah, there, there's is, a couple quotes. I'll give you another one, Howard. So the one is, yeah, a famous exercise scientist once said that everything that gets worse with aging it's better with exercise. So exercise is probably one of the top anti-aging behaviors that you can that you can um, engage in. My other quote with uh, old age is people always say getting old sucks. And I say yes, but being old is even worse. So enjoy getting old while you can. And when you guys are not old yet, you're getting old. And the, the exercise that you can do uh, uh, can really help delay that aging process so that you're not 
being old. You know, some of, some of these uh, old guys do a variety of exercises. I, I don't include myself among them. I, I walk and I used to go to the gym before COVID, but uh, but some of them do particular things. Somebody's asking about dancing. Now, I don't know if that's cha-cha or, or, or if it's modern dance. And somebody else was asking about swimming. What's your take on those exercises? Those are fantastic exercises. And what I've realized through a lot of these talks is specific exercises, even though we might say, hey, do any of these things. Yes, dancing's uh, uh, very good. These other um, uh, you know, swimming is very good. Sometimes particular exercises have meaning to people. And I remember um, Howard, one guy who was a, a swimmer, and when he went in for radiation, they had to put little marks uh, to sort of mark where the radiation was going to go. And they told him not to swim for a few weeks um, because it will wash off these marks in terms of uh, the radiation. And he said that was a big negative psychological effect, even though somebody could say, OK, yeah, well, just jog for you know a while or just to do the elliptical. But swimming was very meaningful for him. And then I had a woman with breast cancer, same with tennis. You know, they said, oh, yeah, well, don't don't play tennis because, you know, you're at risk of lymphedema from the surgery there, maybe do these other activities. But they didn't realize how meaningful tennis was in her life. She played it all her life. And, it, and so she played all the way through chemotherapy. And she said, that's what beneficial. So sometimes guys like me just give you generic exercise. We don't care. Yeah, OK, you want to swim, you want to bike or whatever. But if you have an activity, whether it's dancing or tennis or something that has meaning for you, that I think is really important. Yeah, Bill, you had something? Well, um, there was a gentleman, Mr. Khan, that had had his hand up for a while, but I don't see him now. If Well, I, I did communicate with him. and Oh, here he is. He's back. He's back. Um, you go ahead and unmute yourself and ask your question. Uh, my name is Shaf Khan. I've been uh, on active surveillance since 2017. Uh, initially, they found three spots. Now they're saying one, one of the one of the biopsies. I had four biopsies, so one of them showed is only one spot. Now they're saying there's two spots. The latest one I had, Sunny Brook, was that there's two out of twelve uh, sites and positive cores. Wait, 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 let, let me well, interrupt you. Is this a, this is a program about exercise? So do you have an exercise question? So yeah. being seeing all these results, does exercise helps? Yeah, yeah. So so that would be the the, the key question there. So you can get um, um, these cores, different numbers being positive because these you know the little biopsies are going in all different places into the prostate. So sometimes they can grab a little uh, uh, prostate cancer, and other times they might miss it. In fact. We know some guys uh, will get these cores done and they're told, oh, there's no cancer. And they, but the uh, urologist will warn them, it's just likely we didn't find it in these particular ones. So the fact that it's going up or down to two cores or four cores is not necessarily meaning that it's progressing. It can be a bit of a chance element as they try and sample the prostate and, and see where the cancer is. So obviously uh, you follow up with urologists. But the exercise we would suggest if it's slowing the, the progress of the cancer, yeah, we'd expect that you wouldn't be increasing the number of cores that are positive, and there's no increase in the grade of the prostate cancer. That's one of the key things. We call that the reclassification where they say, okay, we found prostate cancer, whether it's two cores or four cores, but now we think it's a much higher grade or it's a much higher stage. So what we've seen with the exercise studies is it it um, reduces the chance of these prostate cancers being reclassified into a higher grade or a higher stage. But it's still Gleason score six for the last five years. Yeah, so that's good news then. Even if there's more cores there, but if the, the grade is not um, increasing, they might say, you know what, we're, we're not worried about that. Because typically um, they're, they're looking for a, a reclassif reclassification of the grade or the, the stage of the tumor. Okay, so we've got another question from uh, Richard Beal. Would you like to ask your question, Richard? Uh, yes, uh, thank you. Uh, 
I'm being, uh, I just had a procedure that's going to prepare me for radiation treatment. And uh, what they've done is they've inserted the uh, gel pad to, in, in between the prostate and, and the rectum to protect the rectum during radiation. So my question is, uh, can I exercise with weight training that, for example, you know, using squats or doing sit-ups or kettlebell swings, would that uh, affect the gel pads placement in between the prostate and rectum? Uh, do I have to be much more cautious with the type of exercise with the gel pad? Because it's going to stay there for uh, six months before it's absorbed in the body. Yeah, great question, uh, Richard. And unfortunately, uh, you're going to have to talk to your radiation oncologist or your urologist about whether there's any concerns that that gel pad might move with vigorous, you know, uh, vigorous biking or, as you said, squats and those types of things, because I'm not aware of what concerns they might have. But I can make a couple other points as well about the that. So one, you've, you've probably all heard of bracket therapy as well. So this is the insertion of small radioactive pellets into the prostate. And so this is another way of treating prostate cancer. These little tiny pellets are inserted into the prostate and they're left there. And I remember talking to a radiation oncologist saying, any concerns about exercise moving those radioactive, radioactive pellets in the prostate cancer? And he said, no. He said, we had no uh, concerns about that. So these guys can go and do uh, their biking, all their exercises, and it's not going to um, uh, move these pellets around in the prostate. But I wasn't aware, Richard, of the gel pad. But the other good news I can give you is going on to radiation therapy, exercise may really uh, help with that treatment. We've done studies not in prostate cancer, but in rectal cancer. And these patients also get um, radiation to their uh, uh, rectal cancer tumors. And what we've shown in that study and what some of these preclinical studies have shown is exercise increases blood flow to these tumors. And these tumors um, that are exposed to exercise get more vascularized. So the, the, the blood vessels are not always good quality in these tumors, but exercise can improve the vasculature in these tumors and these tumors become better perfused more blood flow into the tumors. That increases the oxygenation of the tumors. And theoretically, that should improve the effectiveness of radiation therapy. Tumors that are hypoxic don't respond well to radiation therapy. Tumors that are well oxygenated are very radio sensitive. And we showed in our study that the rectal cancer patients who exercised were more likely to have a complete response, meaning the tumor was gone after the radiation therapy compared to those who didn't exercise. So I think if you're following any sort of exercise program, this we talked a little bit about leading up into these treatments, it may be particularly helpful if you're going on to radiation therapy, improving the oxygenation of those tumors, making them more sensitive to the radiation therapy. Um, I think, I think what, what I'm going to end up doing is take a more cautionary approach and not do uh, <clears throat> any exertion that, that requires the core of the body to stick mainly with uh, walking and uh, upper body arm exercises to increase the, the blood flow. Anyway, I, I, I appreciate your comments on, uh, on this. Thank you very much. Yeah, I'm going to look yeah. into that, Richard, because it's the first I've heard of these gel pads, and it's a very important question. You know, we don't want to dislodge anything that's been implanted there to, to help with the treatments, but um, I've not talked to any of the uh, urologists or oncologists about that. So I need to look into that. Yeah, Bill, okay, thank you. Well, and Richard, no uh, marathons for you for a couple of months, okay? <laughs> right. <laughs> um, I, I was going to bring, a, I don't know the relevance of this, uh, but, and maybe you can give a context, Carrie, but Liang asks, what about pelvic floor exercise? Is that, that's for different problems, right? Generally, it's for urinary dysfunction, yeah, urinary or um, uh, bowel dysfunction. So, and that typically will uh, occur after a radical prostatectomy. So, when you have your prostate surgically removed, uh, you can have problems with urinary incontinence. And then those pelvic floor exercises become important. For you guys, it's probably not much of an issue. But if you go on to 
uh, uh, surgery or even the radiation therapy, you know, some of the side effects, and I'm sure your doctors have talked to you about what might come are related to urinary functioning and bla bladder functioning and, and um, fecal uh, incontinence and stuff as well. And that's where those pelvic floor exercises can be helpful. So let's go on to another quick question. Someone is inquiring about infrared saunas. Have you come across anything regarding that, doctor? Infrared saunas, yeah. So the only um, issue about the, the saunas is sometimes um, uh, people will say that treatments can be a bit more effective when the body's warm. So you'll see this in some chemotherapy deliveries. They'll say, yeah, we want to heat the body a little bit or heat the organ a little bit or even heat the chemotherapy a little bit. Uh, and it'll help those treatments be more effective. And it's possible that that's even one of the mechanisms of exercise because the core temperature, the core body temperature in exercise increases. And this can be helpful if you're receiving treatments. But uh, other than that, assuming you're not receiving any sort of treatments, I'm not aware of any impact that the, the sauna might have on, on prostate cancer cells. Yeah, Bill, how about Alan uh, Waddell? Yes. I have one quick question. Um, I'm 68, recently uh, put on active surveillance, and I'm wondering of, uh, you know, everybody that, people that do exercise that, or on active surveillance, what percentage uh, over time, 15 years from now, do you have data on how many men need other treatment further down the line? Yeah, Ellen, great question. We have one study on that uh, topic and it's just been uh, reviewed recently. So this was a study on newly diagnosed men just like you. So they're starting active surveillance. Uh, and now they only followed these men for two years. So we don't have the long-term data that you're asking for. But they did show an association. So they assessed these men's exercise levels, followed them up in, in two years. And what they found is the men who didn't exercise, somewhere around 27% of them went on to a uh, um, definitive treatment at two years, compared to about 7 or 8% of the men who exercised. So a substantially lower risk of going on to have uh, medical treatments for prostate cancer at two years. Uh, if you were exercising when you were newly diagnosed. And I'm sure they'll follow these men for longer. We might get some of the data for these longer term follow ups. But that uh, is one study that just been published recently trying to address that question and looked very favorable for the men who are exercising. Now we Thank should you. definitely call on Mr. Wilk who's coming to us. He may win the award for the longest distance. He's coming to us from Poland. I think this is the first time we've had a Polish uh, participant. So is it Wiesla? Hi. Hi, that's my name. Why uh, did you ask? Uh, I have a question. I'm just um, 65. I was diagnosed a year ago with the prostate cancer. And uh, you've been talking about the exercising and pretty moderate exercising means for the somebody who almost didn't do any exercise i'm doing uh, uh, i can say more than moderate exercise and my question is i'm doing like twice a week at tennis two hours pretty intense means when my cardio is going to from 80 to 160 even extreme is there any possible negative uh, interference with the prostate cancer or no, no interference? Yeah. We don't think there's any uh, interference at, at the amount that you're doing. The only stuff that gets discussed in the literature sometimes is these very crazy levels of exercise. So these are your marathon runners. These are your... Um, triathletes and stuff that are doing very high volumes of tons of exercise, but oftentimes they're very competitive. And in that level, sometimes we do see it starts to undermine the immune system functioning and that these uh, very elite um, uh, athletes are at higher risk of upper respiratory tract infections and stuff as well, because 
they're wearing down their body from too much exercise. But that is a very, very high level of exercise. What you're describing a couple hours of tennis twice per week is fantastic and it's right in that sweet spot where you're getting really optimal benefits from it. So I'd have no concerns with the exercise program you're doing. Thank you very much. I don't know if this is a little bit off, but uh, how does exercise correlate with high food? Correlate with? I, I, well, it's a different type of high intensity, right? High intensity frequency something. Uh, it's a treatment, you know, the high food treatment. It's a type of focal therapy. I've not heard of that one, Howard. Sorry. Hey, they're doing it in Toronto. I can tell you that. Dr. Klotz is studying it, but I we, we were just taking a step. You can add that to your research list. Yes, absolutely. H-I-F-U. Oh, yeah. The newer treatments are coming out all the time. Absolutely. There's a question from Curve about does the recent <clears throat> does the recent comment that exercise increases blood flow in tumors contradict the notion that exercise helps combat pc yeah so you're right these mechanisms can sometimes be working in different directions and it's not sort of a, a perfect that every single mechanism that exercise changes is in a good direction so sometimes we have things moving in different directions and so your, your questioner is correct. Well, maybe we don't want to increase blood flow to these tumors. So this is something we have to keep in mind when we're studying exercise in the active surveillance setting. What's that blood flow uh, going to do to that tumor? But it has these paradoxical effects. So on the one hand, you might say improving blood flow and increasing tumor vascularization makes the tumor grow more. And that's a possibility. And we see that in some of these preclinical models. But we also find that increasing a little bit of blood flow um, to the prostate tumor keeps the tumor cells at home. So in other words, as a tumor starts to die or its blood flow is not very good, it's more likely to shed cells. And so this, of course, would be the worst possible outcome for you guys, right? That at some point um, you decide, okay, I think I need a treatment, and they tell you it's metastasized, it's already spread. So keeping those prostate cancer cells at home might be another benefit of exercise by improving that vascularization. Um, but it can be mixed in terms of what we're seeing in these preclinical models. But what we do know is in most of these studies, these tumors are growing more slowly with exercise. So these other mechanisms are compensating for any sort of increased blood flow to the tumor that might be facilitating its growth. Okay, we're getting pretty close to the end of our meeting. I'd like to remind everyone that it's being recorded. Uh, it will be up on our website pretty soon and also on Zoom. So just keep an eye for your email or keep an eye for an email from us uh, announcing when it is ready. So Howard, do you want to, um, we have any last minute questions or Howard, you want to chime okay. in? Uh, the only thing I want to do is thank Carrie for doing the uh, Active Surveillance 101 and for taking the time to answer our questions today. I think we got a lot of questions in. We never can get them all in. But, you know, Carrie, thanks for taking time on a Saturday uh, when you could be running in the snow in uh, Edmonton. So <laughs> thank you for having me, Howard. So I, I'd say I'd say we're pretty done. And again, I would suggest if anybody's interested, we're having Dr. Klotz and Dr. Carroll on Monday at, uh, at a combined ASPE and CAN meeting to talk about, uh, uh, you know, what is the safety factor with active surveillance? Um, at any rate, that's, that's about it for me. Howard, I'd like to jump in real quick. This is Jeff McLennan. I'm your fundraising guy. Just want to make a quick pitch. If any of you got uh, spare change sitting around, uh, go to our website or, or hire a good pigeon. It's aspatients.org. We appreciate a little support. Uh, it goes a long way here. We have excellent volunteers and staff that make this well worthwhile. Thank you. Hey, thanks, Jeff. Thanks, Bill. Thanks to all the ships at sea. 
And thank you all for joining us. And hopefully we'll see you at our meeting next month. Have a good weekend.